Well, we're finally here. Almost two years ago, I took pen to paper over season one of Telltale's The Walking Dead and spoke basically to excess about a game most people had played, enjoyed, and then just moved on from. Like most things in life that have elicited even the mildest emotional response from me, I just couldn't put it behind me. I made a pretty thorough review, I had fun with it, and in the infancy of my channel, no one really got a chance to see it. It was a full one year and 11 days before it even hit 100 views, and I mean, that was numbers on my channel back then, I was extremely proud, but I had other stuff to be uploading about, so I decided to wait until the day someone actually asked me to make the part two I promised all those decades ago. Jennifer Terry was the commenter who finally got the wheels back in motion, so a big thank you to them. And it's good timing too, since I copped a copy of it on the PlayStation 3 store recently and got to play it in all its terribly optimised freezy glory. Seriously, in the twilight of Telltale's career, this game ran like two marbles juddering around in a tin can. I've never seen a game equivalent of Fuzzy Felt struggle so much to maintain itself on any level. I gave this game the grace of a good proper try, I played it through twice, taking polar opposite approaches each time. In one approach, I focused on long term loyalty, I was distrustful of the new group and I was loyal to Kenny at every opportunity. In the other playthrough, I tried to build bridges with my new zombie fighting colleagues and basically put everything I had into these new relationships instead. And after all that time, all that consideration, all those chances, I am finally ready to talk to you about why The Walking Dead Season 2 had the weakest writing in the entire series. And I mean, I try not to say this in a way that makes me sound like a slobbering tit, but I am going to be looking at it thematically. Usually I dissect games chronologically, going through the story beat by beat and then analysing it at the end. Sometimes I split games down the middle and talk about the pros and cons without any specific direction. However, this time I'm going to talk about the main themes I believe this game tried to focus on. From this we're going to talk about them in relation to the game and use them to frame some general criticisms I had with it, and then we're going to talk about how this game fell flat on its face trying to explore them. Before I begin, we'll be going into full spoilers for seasons 1 and 2 of The Walking Dead, obviously The Telltale's Walking Dead, not the TV show, so keep that in mind that we are in spoiler territory now, you have been warned, and it is actually illegal for you to complain from this point on. Don't fact check that. Secondly, a huge thanks to my patrons for their support as always. My Patreon is linked in the description below, my cheapest tier is $3, so if you watch a lot of my content and you fancy supporting my reviews, please check it out. Furthermore, check out my Twitch over at twitch.tv slash if you want to come chat about games in real time every other day at 7 p.m. UK time. Finally, if you enjoy the video, make sure to drop a like, comment your own thoughts on Telltale's Walking Dead, and subscribe to me here on YouTube. I post videos as often as I humanly can, game reviews, ranking, general discussion, so if that sounds like something you would enjoy, stick around so you never miss another upload from me. Thank you in advance for watching, and let's get to work. Oh, shit. Since I played through this game twice, I sat with season 2 of The Walking Dead for the better part of 12 hours. 12 hours of my life that are now lost to the swirling abyss of half assed button prompts and Fallout 4-esque dialogue options. I'm not an asshole. Are well, you calling me an asshole? <laughs> endlessly tortured by three different ways of saying yes to something, and then watching Clementine's face glitch into the shadow realm. Did you know that you can comfortably fail almost every single QTE in this game and it will just soldier on? In most cases it will just play out exactly as it would anyway because they didn't have time to make many failure states. In those 16 hours however, I feel like I picked up on four of the key themes of this game. Four key themes that I can imagine were scribbled on a whiteboard in the planning room and circled in time for a hasty 20 minute mind mapping session. These were trust, whether blood is thick than water, whether people can change, and this one might just be a coincidence brought about by the resource limitations, but predestination and the butterfly effect. But before I focus on any one of these questions, let's quickly sum up the situation. If you've not played Telltale's Walking Dead so far, I recommend checking out my new video from the first game. It will include a description of the story so that you can catch up, general reviews of the gameplay since I won't be covering those again here unless it's relevant, and since a lot of the actual story is relevant in season 2, we'll be able to look back and pinpoint the exact moment our beloved writer just thought fuck it and stuck another Lee scene in. Besides, I've cried during that season every time I've played it and I've played it three times, so I have absolutely no desire to relive it. Just seeing Lee walk towards that bin has me turning away. Why can't you hear me, Lee? Don't go near the bin, Lee. For those of you who are familiar with the first series, we begin season two a few years after the end of that ordeal and we get a rough retelling of the events that followed the most gutting moment in video game history. After escaping the marsh house and the town of Crawford, Clementine, the embodiment of adorableness, wanders out into the wilderness 
us only to run into two familiar faces, Omid, Short King and Bundle of Golden Retriever Energy, and Krista, Functional Adult with Ponytail. After our time skip, the two are still happily roaming with Clementine, and Krista is wildly pregnant. Babied up, I believe is the medical term. This tiny assorted family stops at a public bathroom to rest, but when Clementine gets held at gunpoint by a desperate stranger, Omid comes in and fumbles the bag pretty hard. The girl shoots Omid in the chest and he's dead dead, and accustomed to doing all of the work in the relationship, Krista walks in and blows a hole in the girl. As Krista falls to her knees and cries over the cooling body of her dead bed meat, we are introduced to what will become a recurring happenstance throughout this game and the games beyond. Deaths that are kind of sad, but you can't massively bring yourself to care. Ah well, rest in peace Omid. We fast forward. Clementine is 11 years old and Krista is not looking so great. She's no longer pregnant, but she's also not carrying a baby, so God knows where she last left it. I choose to believe she had it, then it was taken in by a loving family who only had room for one. Yeah, that's how it'll be. The child went to live on the farm. Very happy, very healthy. We just can't visit them. Krista's tired and irritable and broken, and frankly I can't fault her for that, but she blames Omid's death and whatever else on Clem. As she stokes the fire, she casts this absolutely exhausted look over her shoulder, and damn, I've worked with a few people who have made me feel exactly how Krista looks. Krista walks away from the camp and gets cornered by a group of dudes. They demand to know who she's with, and despite the fact that she can't stand to look Clementine in the eye after all this time, she won't rat her out. That's my girl, Krista. A true ride or die bitch to the bitter end. Clem, at least my Clem, distracts the guys, allowing Krista to escape, and then runs off. After a series of QTEs that are more like tapping X to skip dialogue than they are actually about challenging you, Clementine falls into the river and washes away, never to see Krista again. Never again? You say? Yes, never again. Clem will vaguely mention Krista from time to time, but that's it, it's all gone. After an interesting setup, Krista is gone from the series forever. Like after you finish secondary school and you never see nor hear from your classmates again, despite tearful promises to always stay in touch, and a decade later you've got no idea what they're doing with themselves. There's not even a callback to her later in the series, in seasons 3 or 4 or even the Michonne DLC, like a little note or a zombie with her clothes on just to let us know what happened to her. And because of the state of this franchise, I do really like the detail, but I have no idea whether that was intentional. Whether she was supposed to return, but it was cut for budget reasons, or whether she was supposed to have her end revealed to us in a note or a bit of dialogue and it was just forgotten, as the project and developer got passed around like a hat of keys at those special parties your parents go to. That'll be a recurring issue throughout this review. Intended writing or budget constraints? It wasn't like I was happy to be done with Krista either. She seems alright. But more the way, if purposeful, this detail doesn't shy away from the fact that in a post-apocalyptic world, separation, even on a small scale, likely means you'll never see each other again. You can spend months or years with someone, only to one day just vanish from each other's lives in a blink of an eye. People get split up and that's it. No going back. Abrupt. Definitive. And with that we begin The Walking Dead Season 2. So first of all, I want to talk about the theme of trust. Trust is a recurring theme in this season. In some cases it's more implicit but once or twice it is just occasionally blurted outright in case we missed it, specifically by a man called Carver, who we will cover later. There are a lot of questions that this game kind of raises about trust. Should a child be trusted at face value? Is there a threshold of size in a community before trust is easier to give? Or is it even genuine trust if you're just trusting them because you know you can overpower them? Trust with weapons, trust with information, trust with safety and well-being. The story wants to tackle it to some extent, but I feel like Telltale was churning games out at such a high rate at this time that they had the designers create all the maps and all the character models, and then set the writers loose and told them to make a story with whatever they had available, which in this case was like 10 very simple scenes in a cabin interior. That's the only reasoning I could think of for this, because even with such a basic overarching theme as trust, their narrative decisions are pretty baffling. After Clementine is swept away from her miserable life with Krista, she climbs out of the river and scavenges for food. She finds some beans, she meets a dog, the dog wants the beans, the dog rips her arm to shreds in a desperate bid to steal said beans. She trusted the dog because it was cute and it ripped her open like a Tesco bag for life on a long walk home. I don't even like beans, man. The bite gets worse. Clementine is losing blood, she's hungry and tired out in the wilderness. It's only when she collapses that she is suddenly saved by two men she will soon learn are called Lucas and Pete. We'll talk about all the characters in greater deal later, but the situation we're immediately presented with is that in a zombie apocalypse where the rapid acting disease is spread via bites, Clementine has a nasty bite on her arm and these strangers don't know what caused it. Lucas asks us about the bite and no matter what you answer, he blurts 
puts out and see you sink your teeth into Pete's neck, which starts a long line of dialogue options where only one response was ever recorded to save time and therefore all of Clementine's possible dialogue options never quite fit the response she gets from the character. All in all, you essentially have two approaches here. You can be open and honest about the bite or you can try to distract them from it or deflect it. I tried both and the results were exactly the same. No matter how well you talk your way through this, they'll take you back to the house to help you out. As you're approaching the cabin, you're met by your new cast of colourful and diverse characters, only for them to suddenly have you on trial. The group has a fairly understandable reason to not let you in. You're a stranger and you've been bitten, and although you insist you were bitten by a dog, no amount of puppy dog eyes or pleading gets you into that house. What do they do? Lock Clementine up in a bedroom until morning, a cupboard, or even just send her away? No, they take an 11 year old girl and put her in the shed. They lock her up and tell her that if she survives the night, they will treat her wound. And the ideas of dying of pneumonia after escaping a freezing cold river and walking around in drenched clothes are forgotten about because plot armour, I guess. That is some very soggy plot armour. I felt like in season one they had enough time and resources to at least make you feel like you made a difference. I talk about this in my first video quite a lot, but there's a very convincing illusion of choice in season one. You might end up in exactly the same place in exactly the same state by the end of that game, but the first time I played I genuinely assumed I was impacting the direction of the story. It was only on a replay that I realised I wasn't, and it was because of the group and its reaction to you that was tailored to your dialogue and even the smaller choices you made that every step in that game felt organic. People fall out with you hard when you are honestly just trying to help. People lose hope and feel useless. People, looking at you Larry, just don't really like you for reasons you can't control. In season 2 you'll say something and get a response back so vague that you know it was intended to cover at least two of your options. In season 1, characters' attitudes will be impacted by Lee's attention to Clementine, his willingness to help around the camp, his charity, his ability to keep zombies away, and even the colour of his skin. Sometimes he could convince or compromise, but sometimes he just couldn't reason with anybody. In season 2, all the characters just cluster around one big factor, in this case the dog bite, and each have two dimensional responses to it. I feel like the writers put a post-it note on their little whiteboard and wrote, Clementine is bitten when she arrives at the house, and just wrote down the other characters' specific responses to that and how they would feel in that moment, and then worked backwards. Rebecca doesn't want to let you in because she's a bitch. Alvin wants to let you in because he's a doormat. Luke wants to let you in because they needed a nurturing character. Nick won't let you in because he's scared of zombies. In a vacuum, as an isolated event, sure, but played out it's woefully underdeveloped. But it's so strange, why would any adult make that choice about an 11 year old child? An 11 year old child whose clothes are still likely wet and cold from having fallen in a river, with a bite that won't stop bleeding and will only get worse if not cleaned and treated, without even a change of clothes or any food or water. This whole section made me very puzzled. They natter on about her bite and her becoming a walker, but if she dies from an infected bite she'll become a walker anyway. One of these people is an actual doctor, surely he would know that. One woman, Rebecca, fucking hates Clementine for some reason. They made her extra spiteful, I imagine, to serve the purpose of being a stone wall that won't let you into the house. Not out of concern for herself, look at the way she looks at you, she hates you and there's no way you can reason with her, even if you have everybody else on side. One of them, a fellow called Nick, is very insistent on just putting Clementine out of her misery. He stands in front of her with a rifle and ends up misfiring out of tense panic, at which point he's shunted out of the way and told to go play with his Lego set. Another guy, Pete, suggests they cut off Clementine's arm. For a collection of adults, I can understand their concerns, but I have no idea why they can't seem to consider a remotely doable compromise. Sure, they don't want to waste medical supplies on a person who might turn, but this idea is hardly a clever one either. This is where the game really begins that trust narrative, and it makes a big deal of it, and then it fucks it. I feel like the writers needed to make a situation that raised questions about trust, but had so little time to put something together that they just ended up with this. Maybe the house was all mapped and modelled ready and they had to use that scene no matter what, so this moral conundrum just sort of exists and no one in the game acts even slightly relatably. Spoiler alert, it is set up for a really, really shit payoff that goes nowhere, but we will get to that in a bit. No matter what you do, how well you word it, how careful you are, you will never be able to sleep in that house. In one playthrough, I was honest and kind and open. I pleaded and was sincere. I got locked in the shed. On another playthrough, I was manipulative and I blackmailed and I still had no luck. That's not out of the realm of possibility really, like if there's no trust, there's no trust, but why make me sleep in the shed? Lock me in a bedroom or something. I can only assume this segment was included to force Clementine, both physically and emotionally outside of the new group, to prevent any actual bonding with any of the group too early. But why? Firstly, we have Carver. After Clementine's ordeal, she's finally let into the house and she hangs out there while the team go out. A man arrives called Carver, an extremely forgettable man who seems like a shitter version of that cannibal paedophile from The Last of Us voiced by Nolan North, who you can definitely hear sounds almost exactly like Nathan Drake and will never not notice now that it's pointed out to you. He's a man Clementine doesn't know, but he knows the group. Carver essentially forces his way into the house asking for information. He says, when you met them, how much did they trust you? If people 
don't trust you, how can they trust them? Very clever, Telltale? Make the new team really weirdly, obtusely, aggressively distrustful to the point of locking Clementine in a shed, and then have a man show up an hour later to go, hmm, notice that lack of trust. Isn't that an interesting way to cast a new light on the people you've met? Isn't that curious? Doesn't it make you think twice about me, this interesting new villain whose name you'll forget the second you do anything else? Doesn't it make you think twice about the people you meet and how they might treat you? I am very clever, and I have creepy background music. Not really, Carver, since this group of people are obviously my new family group, and obviously aren't the bad guys, and you obviously are, you weird snake-eyed shit. The whole grey area of trust or be trusted is just totally lost here on a moral conundrum that makes so little sense no matter the way you look at it. My second theory is to keep you distant from the team and to keep you from taking too much of a liking to them. As I mentioned before, another huge theme in this game is blood versus water. After episode one of this season, we will meet a new group of people, at which point everyone will immediately really like Clem and really want her to like them back, but now Clementine will be forced to make completely binary choices between supporting one or the other. Maybe the writers were worried that we'd get too attached to the first team if they had a running start, so they crowbarred in some distance. The team get back and quiz you about Carver's appearance and ask you how he got into the house, and the game doesn't let you say you guys left the front door unlocked so he just walked into the house without knocking, and they all blow up at you and you just have to stand there and take it. You're not allowed to explain what actually happened, so they assume you're a prime snitch and you get told off for it, but you don't feel guilty but the game won't let you communicate and you don't feel frustrated because they do give you a chance to speak but the game won't let you make any use of it. Clementine, an 11 year old, is an insanely mature and articulate person when the game needs her to be, but she's got all the charisma of Katie Hopkins when the game needs people to dislike you. Fantastically, as soon as Carver is gone, the team has no reason not to trust you anymore, story-wise anyway, and they all immediately have this incredible change of character and attitude. I mean, they have even less reason to trust you now, surely, but no. Now that the antagonist has walked in, said some shit that's supposed to be divisive, and then just walked out again, the team is cool with you. Rebecca especially performs a Resident Evil-style quick turn, and suddenly starts talking about how much you try and how proud she is of you. A few hours ago she was telling us to get the fuck out and die alone in the wilderness, and now she's taking us under her wing like a baby bird. This really is a core issue with a ton of the characters in this game. Aspects of the story are picked up and abandoned exactly as and when they're needed. As soon as Rebecca's spitefulness is no longer needed to keep you out of the house, she suddenly has a cataclysmic change of character. There are a few instances of this throughout the game that we'll cover in time, but long story short, it gets really old. All of a sudden, Clementine is absolutely hoisted into the role of the right-hand man. Luke has her climbing structures to do some recon for them, Rebecca's confiding her child's true paternity in her, Clem is being sent out ahead of the group to scout out the way ahead or fetch food from abandoned buildings while the team rests. She's rewiring wind turbines, sharing bad news with bereaved men, and calling the shots when a strange ginger woman rocks up to ask for food. Whoever they are, they won't shoot a little girl, Luke says smugly, before having Clementine do the talking in an isolated interaction with a stranger. Sure thing, Telltale. Definitely an idea your wider audience could not only get behind but do themselves in a similar situation. Definitely. Not sarcasm at all. Like, we have to understand, Clementine is 11 years old. Do you remember being 11? I was 11 once and I was a bright kid, but I definitely wasn't handling diplomatic relations with rival gangs in my tiny childhood town of Hucknall. I was sitting in my pyjamas playing Spyro the Dragon while my six-year-old brother wiped his nose on me. And these are an established group of adults of all sorts of backgrounds, professions, and consistently awful posture who already know each other, in some cases very well, who immediately just deviate to doing whatever Clementine wants, to the point where they nominate her to be responsible for their food, be a conduit between them and potential allies, and put herself in the path of danger for them. Clementine speaks like an adult, she's extremely articulate, far too articulate for her age, I won't take any disagreements on that. It definitely could be a result of being with Krista for the better part of two years, maybe, you know what, maybe it's just the writers needing a main character that performs certain things and just having to settle for Clementine and therefore making her extremely adult minded. Either way, there's some interesting potential to talk about trust in an apocalypse, but it was neglected harder than a middle child here. Blood is thicker than water is an adage that is used by people to suggest that blood, i.e. the blood shared between family, is thicker than water, which in this instance refers to the bond you share with friends, associates, colleagues, whatever. Before you say yes, it is actually completely misquoted. The full quote is, blood of the coven is thicker than water of the womb, meaning the blood ties between the coven, the people we associate with, is thicker than the water of the womb, i.e. the people you are associated with just because they're family. As the story drags itself kicking, screaming and crying into episode 2, Clementine and her new family leave their cabin and head off into the woods. Carver's spooked them and they need to find somewhere 
need to stay, so they set their sights on the north and head off into the forest. Their walk takes five days, culminating in them meeting a friendly man on the bridge who Nick shoots, thank you Nick, you fucking idiot, and eventually a beautiful ski lodge lit up like a Christmas tree with huge windows and open curtains. I'm sure that won't be a problem, boys. It's here that we meet Kenny. Surprise, he didn't die in the first game, he's here. And this is where the game goes, hey, remember Kenny? He's your family, your group, they're your friends. Time to pick one, because they're going to hate each other for no good reason until you do. Although none of Clementine's actual family are alive anymore, this game definitely creates a conflict between Clementine's old life, represented by Kenny, Krista and Lee, and Clementine's new life, represented by Lucas and the gang, and a few people we'll meet later. There's a conflict between the loyalty you have to Kenny, who immediately hates and is actively aggressive towards your new companions, and the new people in your life who could represent an entire fresh start for Clementine. So there were a few key players here, two ghosts of zombie past and two ghosts of zombie future. The first is Lee, strangely. Lee has been dead for the better part of two years, yes I did warn you of spoilers, but the series never really lets him go. I don't either though, so it would be hypocritical for me to mock Telltale for it when I burst into uncontrollable sobbing whenever I hear Lee's voice actor speak in any other game I've seen him in. For all intents and purposes, he is the Joel Miller of flesh-eating zombie apocalypses, a father figure who takes an orphan girl under his wing, travelling across states, guiding her past the worst of humanity, and building an incredible bond. I don't know what it is about father figures, but they really do thrive beyond the collapse of society. Anyway, Lee dies after a successful rescue attempt when Clementine is nabbed by some weirdo, and she carries a lot of the blame with her. She really misses Lee, even at the start of this season she cracks open her bag to find a photo of him, but also a drawing done by Duck of Kenny and his family. Lee is martyred in a lot of ways by this game, which will make sense if you've played him as a benevolent father figure, but if you played him as a bloodthirsty arsehole in season 1 it will definitely come off a bit strange when he starts sharing these hushed words of wisdom and everybody reveredly talks about what a gentle and measured man he was. This game introduces these quiet little afterlife scenes that happen when Clementine is close to death, where she wakes up and she's on a train with Lee or in the RV with Lee. Clem will be chatting to him quietly, he'll be calling her Sweet Pea, and he'll be encouraging her to rest. I have a massive gripe with where they took this, but it doesn't actually come to fruition until season 4. For now, it's great. Either way, Lee is our weird Christ figure. He died for our sins, infinitely loving and patient, martyred in death, so on and so forth, and he is the crux of the connection shared between Clementine and Kenny. He represents who they were back when the outbreak happened, he's like an inside joke, he strengthens their bond exclusively just by being mentioned, and no one outside of Clem and Kenny understand, which keeps her new family, Lucas included, at bay. Lucas is a really interesting one. In many ways he is Lee's parallel, except where Lee found Clementine as a terrified and helpless 9 year old, Lucas has found Clementine as a more capable, hardened 11 year old. The context is different and she doesn't rely on him, so the relationship can't be replicated. The two years between seasons 1 and 2 haven't been kind to Clementine, and like every other female video game protagonist on the PlayStation 3 who needs to show that she's grown stronger, she gets put through the fucking ringer Laura Croft style and endures unimaginable pain and suffering. Consequently, the nurturing potential that Luke has is kind of knocked away. He doesn't really have the right to tell Clementine what to do, especially after locking her out of the house after the dog bite, and they're not close enough for her to feel loyal towards him to any extent. In turn, his own allegiances are towards his existing friends, and he never really closes the distance between them. I feel like with the right writing and the proper consideration, he could have become this big brother figure for Clementine, like I feel Javier became for her in season 3, but the game doesn't do anything with it, and once the team arrive in the ski lodge, he's basically abandoned by the story until the final episodes, bar a few moments here and there, where he just makes some blank comments. It was so bad actually that I remember on my first playthrough I assumed that he was supposed to die during the ski lodge attack. The Walking Dead has this fantastic marked for death thing that it does with characters that can die throughout the series. A character will have a lot to say, a lot of relevance to the story, and then they will evade death because of a choice you made, and since they could have died there in that moment, the game can't have them do or say anything important from now on because the paths they've made will branch too far and it's too difficult to account for anymore. As a result they get this marked for death halo where they just sit back and barely speak and no longer contribute to any of the plot and then just die later in a way that you can't prevent instead. In this game in particular it will be like 30 minutes after you've saved them the first time. Looking at you Sarah. If you played Until Dawn you'll know it. How in that game Chris, Ashley and Emily basically just have nothing to say in chapter 8, 9 and 10 since there are so many opportunities for them to die beforehand that the game can no longer accommodate them. I feel like this was a major missed opportunity with The Walking Dead. Spoiler alert, but Luke does die just right at the end, and by then I feel like we'd shared three words so I didn't care at all about him. It could have been a Lee level event, but Lucas was just duked so hard by this title that he became one of the biggest examples of wasted potential I've ever seen. That's how it is with Lucas, and I assumed it was because he had missed a chance to die and consequently would be on his way out shortly, but it was actually 
especially because the writing just didn't need him anymore, and just had Clementine wholeheartedly look to Kenny instead for guidance. Speaking of Kenny, Kenny is the second reflection of Clementine's past. Kenny's an interesting guy. As soon as he meets Clementine and her team, he immediately hates them. He won't sit with them, he won't talk to them without openly mocking them, he won't listen to them, he won't trust them. He treats them like their entire group treats Clementine on first meeting her. It's all outside of his character. He's quite a brisk, hostile man in many ways. He only respects people once they've proven themselves to him, he doesn't like to get close to new people, and most importantly, he only respects people who respect his authority. A new group with their own leadership threatens that, so naturally he's hostile to them in a way so childish that I actually felt awkward. He's reasonably well written at the start of this, before he needs to take action in any way or make any decisions. Clementine pops up onto the scene and all his memories come flooding back, and he slips up and he calls her Duck. You can see the two of them kind of respond to it. It's bittersweet and this brief moment of vulnerability really works with Kenny. He's probably the most nuanced character in the game, at least in episode 2. I like the way he talks about his son especially. All he'd do was run in circles. Couldn't stop him. I'll be honest, as the season went on, I was not a huge fan of Kenny. I would see him lose his temper at both his partners, basically without warning. I would see him snap and beat the shit out of people. He immediately dislikes anybody he meets to the point of being hostile and aggressive with them. I think there's a lot of grace Kenny gets from people who've played the games because he's nice to Clementine, but he's a loose cannon and a ticking time bomb. As the season goes on, he becomes more and more unhinged, which isn't outside the realms of possibility, but the game still really wants you to like him and back him. He starts to get physically aggressive with almost everyone, snapping horribly at people and screaming at them, but the game still shoehorns you into going along with him long after he's past the point of being unsafe to be near. From what I see, he goes easy on Clementine for two reasons. One, she's like his little girl, and two, there are other people to beat up and scream at when things go wrong. When I brought this up on stream all those years ago, I remember people being like, he'd never be abusive to Clementine, she's his baby, he'd hit anyone but her. And I do think that's the biggest misconception about Kenny. The second Clementine is stuck with him alone, or when she grows old enough that he'd no longer be losing his temper at a child, you can bet she'd be in the firing line for one of his fits of rage. Spending time with Kenny is like walking on eggshells every second. He values unquestioning loyalty, but even then he will lose his temper at anyone over the most minor shit. What's more is that if you disagree with him, you've got a pretty fair chance he'll lose his temper at you. He's the kind of person you can be careful and patient with, compromising on everything, and you will still be giving ground on everything you care about until you are just nodding your head at everything he says. And then it will still be your fault when something goes wrong. Like Lee, Kenny is a reflection of who Clementine arguably used to be. She's definitely more childlike around Lee and Kenny, which isn't a problem, obviously. She's 11. She returns to that place of vulnerability and trusts them unconditionally, for better or worse. It's a shame because Lucas really could have been a parallel to Lee, but the game can't get past Kenny. Kenny is a Father Lee figure, kind of, but he's erratic, hot-tempered, and flat-out dangerous. Clementine can never comfortably become close to him. The game constantly pits them against one another, Lucas and Kenny, but the payoff always ends up with Kenny, as Lucas is just pushed further and further out of the central group of characters. There's one point where both Luke and Kenny shout at you to sit and eat dinner with them. You can't say to Luke, oh, sorry, I just want to catch up with Kenny tonight, or sorry, Kenny, I'd like to chat to my new friends, but I'll come and say hello afterwards, or suggest the two of them even sit together. You'll pick one side and Clementine will coldly ignore the other and go and sit with her chosen side. There's no opportunity for damage control and it makes you feel like a dick. It feels like the game is really trying to get you to pick a side in a battle that doesn't need to be fought. Our final person of relevance is a young woman called Jane. Jane arrives into our story a little bit on the back foot. Half of the members of the cabin were never even properly characterised, despite being introduced in episode 1, so there is sparse hope for this woman entering the story at the halfway point. The game does what it can with her, to be fair. She is cold but straightforward, logical, resourceful, and most importantly, absolutely lovely with Clementine. She's an amazing role model for Clem. She teaches her useful survival skills, helps her solve problems, and confides in her in a way that makes Clem see her as a big sister. And she is a big sister, she's great. She's hesitant to get close to Clementine, having had a younger sister who gave up during the early days of the outbreak, but once she figures out Clem isn't going anywhere, she softens up and supports her. Jane is the ideal person for Clementine at this stage in her life, or she would be, however, unfortunately, if she wasn't a mirror to Kenny. As with Lucas and Lee, we now have Kenny and Jane. Now, it's not so much an issue with the characters themselves, but the game really wants you to support Kenny. Despite his destructive tendencies and his increasingly worrying explosions of rage, the game has you siding with him again and again, even when the other characters you're with abandon you out of fear. It culminates in this absolutely ridiculous standoff that Jane is nowhere near stupid enough to think would work. Wanting to prove that Kenny is a loose murderous cannon, Jane pretends to have let a newborn baby die. She leaves baby AJ in a car, safe and sound, but returns to Kenny and Clementine saying she simply doesn't know where he is. She lost the baby. Kenny goes nuts on her and actually does attack her. He grabs a knife and shoves it into her chest and if you don't stop him, he kills her then and there. I don't understand what Jane's logic was 
was and the game never explains it. She's characterised as a very clever, careful and cautious person who just leaves situations when she is unhappy. She doesn't start fights. There were plenty of opportunities to prove Kenny's gone off the deep end too, but I feel like the writers needed a big fight at the end and moment of panic and this was the one they chose. So they picked the fight first and worked backwards from it. Jane and Kenny fight. Okay. But Jane isn't the kind of person to fight, so they now had to work backwards and find a reason why Kenny would attack her without her attacking him first, but since the game really likes Kenny and wants you to like him too, they had to find a reason that people would agree with and would also make the average player murderously angry. A dead baby left in the snow is a very good reason for somebody to absolutely flip their lid. So they worked backwards from there and shoehorned it in despite Jane not even remotely being the kind of person to do something like that, just to manufacture this horrible final fight. In the final moments of the game, you can choose to kill Kenny or kill Jane, and while Jane will die if you simply neglect one QTE, Kenny needs to be actively sabotaged multiple times for him to die. I don't think that it's a man versus woman strength thing. There are a few moments where Jane has the upper hand and could kill him. I think it is the game trying to encourage us and remind us, you know, you've got a soft spot for Kenny, stay loyal to him, despite the fact that Jane is a better role model and a carer for Clementine. When Jane dies, she just dies without a word. When Kenny dies, he goes on a three minute speech and dies with a smile and a tear on his face. Turns out he was a softie all along or something? I don't know. This brings us to another theme that's explored by season two. Can people change? As with basically everything this game poses, we really just do not know whether it ended up how it did because of budget limitations or because it was genuinely intentional. And if it was intentional, what the fuck? And why? Who did this? Because now we're going to talk about Nick and Sarah. Sarah was a shame. Sarah is a lot like Clementine in many ways. She's a young girl with a single father, getting by in a zombie apocalypse. However, she's the opposite to Clementine in other ways. While Clementine is a rugged girl who's lived rough for the better part of two years, Sarah is an extremely sheltered girl whose dad won't let her learn how to use weapons or even really see danger on any level. Sarah's written to be a bit of an oddball, a bit whimsical and silly, but to the point where she's stupid and extremely ignorant. I feel like this game wants you to pity her, and I also feel like this game doesn't really respect her. With Ben in season one, his slow descent into hopelessness is very carefully crafted, and when he dies, it's a bitter, bitter shame. But with Sarah, she is just hopeless and the game will not let you save her. It takes a fuck off then attitude towards her and if you save her life, she'll randomly die a few minutes later. I feel like the game hates her. Clem looks at her from the start like she has zero respect for her, like Sarah gives her a bad taste in her mouth. You're encouraged to lie to Sarah to get what you want and many of Clem's dialogue options can be unnecessarily rude. Sarah has promise. She wants to learn how to defend herself and she takes the news of tragedy very well. She responds well to honesty and wants to learn and be helpful but no matter how much you teach her, help her and guide her, she will die in a way I found very frustrating. There's a point late in the game where she becomes catatonic with fear and sits on the floor of a caravan as zombies are crashing in. She's just lost her dad in a horrifying, gruesome way. You can save her here, and first time through the game I did save her. I yanked her out and took her to the camp with me, only for her to walk on some decking ten minutes later and have it snap under her, dropping her down into a horde of zombies. It felt like a weird tug of war I had with the game. In season one, Ben gives up. He's not interested in trying anymore and you can let him go, but either way he wants to die. If you force him to live after he begs you to let him die, he will die. So it's kind of a tug of war between you and Ben, it's not a tug of war between you and the game. With Sarah, I felt like the game wanted her to die so badly that no matter what I did, suddenly there'd be this final destination coincidence and some random assortment of connected events would suddenly trigger and she'd fall into a wood chipper or something. The game did not want her to live. Sarah, I don't really get whether or not she wanted to live, you know, she never kind of spent specifies, maybe she does. Uh, when you leave her to die in the caravan, she suddenly screams for you to wait and come back, so there is a part of her I think that wants to survive, yet the game just stands next to you like, hmm, what a shame. Like she's played for spiteful laughs, she's just completely irredeemable. The trophy you get for either saving or leaving her to die in the caravan is called a heavy burden, and that's all she is, and I feel like she could have been a lot more. I mentioned a while ago, during the scene where you're at the cabin trying to convince the new group to let you in with your dog bite, that Nick holds a rifle in your face and accidentally fires. For whatever reason it doesn't actually go off, but obviously there's this weird itchy nervous anxious man here with a bolt action rifle and it's a huge problem. When Clementine tries to address the issue with Lucas, he goes, Nick's, Nick's been, been known to go off once, once in a while, don't hold it against him. And that's it. The man almost shot me in the face and that's the game's explanation for it. You can talk about it with Nick, but as far as the group is concerned, the case is closed. It's basically setting up a situation where you know Nick is difficult with a gun, he's twitchy and anxious and he will shoot on sight. Before he commits a horrible foreshadowed atrocity, the game spends a lot of time trying to humor humanise him too. You end up locked in a shed with him and he'll find some moonshine. After a few drinks he explains that he's actually an 
asshole because his mom got bitten and he had to kill her. And Clem actually has the gall to seem sympathetic, like that's an excuse for holding a rifle in a child's face with the composure of an electroshock therapy enthusiast. I don't care, Nick, honestly. And lo and behold, when you're approaching the ski lodge, Nick will randomly shoot some guy in the face. He follows Lucas and Clem out, holds a gun up to a stranger that the pair are speaking very civilly to, they shout at him not to shoot and to back off, and Nick shoots them anyway. The character development in this game is handled with all the subtlety of a brick to the face. To compare this to season one, let's look at an equally unlikable character, Lily. Lily is the daughter of Larry, massive cunt and huge racist, who immediately hates Lee because he's black. Lily is one of those I'm not racist but types, who never actually gets involved in the racial hatred but supports her dad on everything he does and picks his side in every situation, so off the bat she's not one to like. There is something redeemable in her potentially. She appreciates order and rules and she'll always do her part even if she's exhausted and malnourished. She makes difficult decisions, like rationing food, but she's honest and you can get some kindness out of her if you make the effort. In the right situation, I do wonder whether she could be different, and there's a lot of that in season one. Often you can't change situations, but you do wonder whether things would have been different in another lifetime. Long story short with Lily, but by the end of her journey with the team, she's broken and devastated. She has dreadful friction with the group and isolates herself whilst also being pushed away, double whammy, and two members of the team actually kill her dad, for better or worse, taking veritable C4 to the remaining British she had between them. She's not a good person by any means, but as you leave her at the side of the road or she steals your RV, you can see the domino effect that led up to this. She doesn't fit in the group and unfortunately the domino effect of events that happens just pushes her away even more, so this is an inevitable end. There's nothing of that in season 2, no matter how much it pretends. Nick's a dick, he kills people and the game doesn't care and then he dies. Sarah's a burden and she always will be. People don't change. My final point on this game is more of a general one. This is either the most secretly clever thing this team have ever done or it's a direct result of piss poor planning, management and funding for this absolutely exhausted development team and it's the concept of the butterfly effect. Butterflies are a pretty half-assed symbolism in this game. You'll see them a couple of times, there's one on a music disc you find in the ski lodge, there's one on the tree that Sarah stops to pee behind after the events of the ski lodge, but it's never really suggested or discussed in any depth by the game. What it does imply, however, is that every event is a reaction to whatever happened previously. Using the concept of a butterfly effect implies that when you see one event, you'll see everything that caused it. Season 2 tends to have a lot of deaths that trigger events and conflict, whereas in Season 1 deaths are often the consequence of build-up. There's often a moment of silence after deaths in 1. Ben, Doug, or woman option that isn't Doug whose name I've forgotten, Mark and Larry. There's a lot of that in Season 1 deaths almost always be consequences, but never triggers. Deaths aren't this pinnacle of action, they come following a series of events that you only have partial control over. Duck and Catch's death comes as the result of a zombie attack, and it's not used to catalyse action. More to draw to a close a chapter of Kenny's life, and force his character to adapt or struggle under unimaginable grief, which in turn makes him more compassionate, more likely to save Ben later, and generally more loyal to Lee after Lee is bitten, and knowing what Lee is about to go through. There's nothing you could have done at all, but the real skill in the first season season was in concealing that lack of agency from the player. It's half butterfly effect, half technical limitation. They can't account for all these branching paths, so they have to limit their story, and so they have to write a story that caters to that limitation. Sometimes you keep people alive until the end through your choices. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, people die. But you can always see what led to it, whereas in season 2, deaths are used to catalyse action, which makes it feel cheap. Often, characters are so aggressively supposed to die that you'll save them, and they'll die a moment later. See Serati who gets bitten. If you cut her hand off, she screams and alerts the zombies, which immediately kill her. If you save her, she'll die from the bite. There's Sarah, who we covered, and there's Alvin, who either dies in the lodge or is knocked unconscious in the lodge and only shows up for one scene later before he again dies. At one point in the story, three characters leave your group forever, and no matter how much they adore you, and no matter how much you beg to go with them, and no matter how much they say they want you to go with them, the game just won't let you. I understand that the team were likely very concerned about having too many characters alive at the end. You leave with only one of two, or you can go alone, because Having a selection of random characters would be very hard to account for in future games, but I mean, you could just say they split up, you could say they died between games, you could say that they left the team, they got split off from one another, Krista style, they got lost. You know, the game is desperate to make sure no one whatsoever makes it to the end of the game, but it only has 6 hours to remove about 20 people from the lineup, so you've got characters dropping like flies over the most bullshit story beats, and none of them feature that initial cause and effect from the first game that make it so powerful, especially since the first game had a much smaller cast. There's no butterfly effect in this game, despite the use of imagery, and it's kind of an insult. There's one instance with Luke specifically, who falls through ice and drowns in a lake. The game is so desperate to see him gone that it starts yanking in acts of God to deliver these people to the gates of hell. Like, this guy was Lee's parallel, in a way, and you just kind of have him fall through the floor.
Four. It's a shame. I mean, I know that random deaths can happen in real life, but for a game that shows you butterflies, implies there is a butterfly effect causing everything to happen, you know, you've got kind of some contradictory ideas there. Is it an act of God and is it random, or is it a butterfly effect? None of the above, said Telltale. I think all in all the game is crap, but we can't fault the development team for the resources they were allocated. The catastrophic crash of Telltale is widely known across the gaming industry as a cautionary tale, as is working with Randy Pitchford or pre-ordering anything Bethesda make, and in those final days of Rome I can imagine the teams were just spitting out everything they could to meet the horrendous demands from upper management. As a result, the game suffered very badly. Maps and characters were cobbled together first, or at least it seems to be the case, and a stringy story was stretched throughout the remaining available space, meaning situations had to be twisted and contrived to fit this scope, and characters remained laughably underdeveloped. Dialogue options are ten times more illusory than in the first game, the immoral conundrums they pull out of their arse are some of the most half-baked things I've ever seen in writing, and both failure and success feel very critically unearned. Any attempt you make in this game to enact any change or consequence just feels like a tug of war against a spiteful and unyielding game which rips characters and opportunities out of your hands for the spiteful glee of it. Thanks very much for watching my review of The Walking Dead Season 2. I sincerely hoped you enjoyed it, I had a lot of fun writing it, but hardly so much fun replaying this bastard game twice over for the sake of making my points. And condolences to Smooth, who is editing today's video, thank you Smooth, who also had to replay the game to collect footage, so you know, rest in peace. If you liked the editing, please make sure to drop Smooth a little thank you. If you didn't like the editing, keep it to yourself, I don't care, he's my brother. If you liked the video, please drop a like, comment your own opinions on Season 2 of The Walking Dead, and subscribe to me here on YouTube. I make gaming content as often as I can, so if that appeals to you, don't forget to sub so you never miss another upload from me. With that, make sure to hop over to my Twitch at twitch.tv slash if you want more live content every other day, 7pm UK time. With that said, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.